Hi, welcome back. If you recall, I was doing the restoration and repair of this radio in stages, and I'm doing it in stages. And uh, in the last uh, installment of the video log, I'd got as far as uh, going back from the output stages to the preamp stage of the power amplifier. Now, I've gone a bit further. Um, you'll notice that it is generally a lot cleaner. You don't see that much or very little dirt in between the components on the top of the chassis. And you will notice that I haven't done an absolute cosmetic cleanup in, in, an, in extremis. Uh, I've actually gone very softly over it. Uh, you'll see some of those spots over there. That isn't really rust, that's some kind of liquid that's poured on there and it's not easy to get out. And I have to make a choice now because there are various ways of getting this thing cleaned up and one of them is pretty radical and involves um, using some liquids that actually do quite a bit of damage to the metal and you then have to protect it or you end up with something that's rusting within a couple of weeks. I had this beautiful Saba radio, a few spots on the chassis and I decided to to do a pimp my radio on it. I wanted it uh, to get a stainless steel gleam, which uh, is all very well and good, but I forgot some of the principles of uh, metallurgy. I got on to the spots and all the rust spots and all the dirt spots with some abrasive material, got it all shiny, got all the capacitors shiny, all the uh, IF cans over there shiny, this thing looked like something out of a, a steampunk movie. And it really looked good. Except I forgot to protect it. And within a couple of weeks, I had uh, fingerprint marks that had basically rusted. And in general, the chassis was looking pretty grubby. Worse than before. The other thing that happens when you do a rather abrasive cleaning is that some of these markings come off. Especially on the capacitors and on the cans that ink comes off and you actually lose some of the information which I think is important to retain in these old radios. So if you do do that you have to be prepared to go back and give it a, a clear coat of spray or, or something similar to create a protective barrier um, on the metal and it can be quite gratifying to see this shiny chassis once you've finished. So it's really a personal choice. What I prefer to do is I prefer to do a general cleanup like I've done, get the radio repaired, get it all working properly, and then go back and uh, clean it up a little bit more meticulously if I choose to. Right, so what I have here at the moment is really a fully restored radio. con este tema. Right, that was FM, um, and I'm only using a very short antenna, literally, this thing over here, stuck into one of the dipole antenna sockets at the back. Now the, uh, the restoration has gone further than just FM, is this, IF, this can over here. It has all the sensitive FM circuitry, detector circuitry inside. Um, covered in, in the metal can so that it doesn't pick up any noise. 
But I've also gone further and uh, all the bands are working. So FM, the KW is short wave, MW is medium wave, LW is long wave. They're all working to various degrees of sensitivity and selectivity depending on the distance to these transmitters, depending on the time of day, depending on all sorts of things. I have a, an external long wire antenna in place here. Not uh, technically the best solution, but it's one that I get by on. And I've tested it. It works very well. The antenna, um, the external antenna, antenna can also be swapped or, play, or substituted for this, which is called the FA, the ferrite antenna. The FA brings in to effect that ferrite antenna over there, which is particularly sensitive on medium wave. What you will get is a quieter medium wave reception. It makes one heck of a difference. You can sometimes barely hear a station using the long wire antenna. And when you put it into the ferrite antenna, it picks up very well. This particular radio doesn't allow you to rotate that antenna because the ferrite ant antenna is directional. So you can change the strength of pickup depending on what the orientation is. If I move this around left and right, it will affect the reception um, and the strength of reception using the ferrite antenna. Some of the other German radios I've restored actually have a, a rotation knob at the front which makes it a lot easier to tune in. But it does make a, a great difference. And um, what I pick up here is short wave uh, pretty clearly. Medium wave, uh, there's actually one medium wave station we're transmitting from here. Um, I do pick up a lot of Spanish stations from the Canary Islands, so it's picking up quite well. And uh, the, the long wave is just sporadically there from some transmitters in France and I believe some on the North African continent. This is what the chassis looks like, the chassis that this radio came in. If you look closely, you start to get a fault here. The lacquer's fell, fallen off the side, it's rusty, it's got humidity marks there. That trim at the top there, all the way around, it actually uh, uh, contains a metal braid which acts as a, an FM antenna, dipole antenna. You then connect it around the back. So it's actually quite useful. The cloth is in pretty good shape. Nothing that a wash and a, a bit of brushing won't get into its perfect state. Need to get the shine back on the logo. Same with the, uh, that uh, emblem there through which you see the magic eye. Some of the other metal parts need a bit of work on. This might actually seem like uh, it needs very little, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work away from getting to the stage that I wanted at. Um, this will be sanded down to the original wood completely. Then the uh, color will be put on, some kind of varnish depending on what color I want. I want the as close to the original as possible. That usually takes two or three uh, layers to get it right. Then I'll start on the lacquer. That can be five, six layers depending on how much uh, piano finish I want on there. And uh, I also have to put in this golden stripe in there that goes in after the first layer of lacquer so that it becomes part of the lacquered surface and is protected. And the final result is something more like this. This is a Saba Freiburg 8 that I finished restoring just before starting this project. This radio is fantastic in terms of sound in terms of selectivity, it is unbelievable. And it's from 1958. It is a big, big, big beast. 
Uh, this particular one has achieved something which is very difficult to do. It's called the WAF factor, wife approval factor. It's got a very high wife approval factor. She actually likes it, which is amazing. Usually it's not the case. This particular one has automatic tuning. So when you put it on auto, you flick it to the right or the left and it'll search. The knob actually turns by itself till it finds a station and then it adjusts it for optimal tuning on that station. And that's a fantastic function for a radio that's from 1957. Brilliant. Anyway, this is where I want it to be. There's that gold trim. This is the kind of finish that I want from this Gretz before I'm satisfied. And that, quite frankly, is a project in itself. So it will be happening, it will be recorded, it will be logged in the future. I can't tell you exactly when, but it will be. And now we'll get back to the Gretz and the circuit, the diagram part, to show you what I came up with, what I found and what was done. Right, if you recall, I said I was going to start on the, or continue from where I had finished off. This section here had been done. The power amp, the preamp stage had been done, and I was going to move on backwards. So, the first stage uh, that I did was actually to focus on the, um, the switching switching section, which is that section over there. All these switches are on those two uh, separate switching um, panels that go onto the front and they perform various functions and um, I will show you what some of them do. This one over here, what this one does, uh, there is a external speaker button which is over here. What this does is it actually connects an external speaker in. You've got the speaker at the top here and it allows for an external speaker to be connected and what that switch does is it uh, it switches in and out of circuit that external speaker. So that's the the, the one uh, speaker there, that one there, that button over there. So that was all checked, everything worked well. The second button is MA Magic Eye and what this does is it, uh, it cuts the power supply from the B plus to the magic eye. Now the B plus is up here. It comes from this point here, goes down, goes through that switch there, in there, up there, and it goes to the EM80 magic eye. And as you can see, if I activate that switch over there, it's simply going to disconnect the power from the magic eye. And that allows me to um, save the eye tube, if that's what I want. Now, I did mention earlier that the condition of this magic eye was particularly good, particularly new, um, and it's not a replaced tube. It seems to be an original. And this would indicate to me that whoever owned this radio, uh, unless they didn't use it much, but whoever owned this radio operated it mostly with the magic eye turned off. Uh, so it saved the life of the tube. This is a strange one. It's... 4R. Now, uh, something to do with room uh, sound. It's something to do with surround sound. It's probably the 1950s version of Dolby Surround. Uh, but it's obviously not there because these speakers don't exist. Um, I had mentioned in the first video, first log of this uh, restoration, that there were some loose wires hanging around. And I had no idea what they were. I've discovered subsequently this radio has an extra two small speakers on the top ends facing outwards through a small grill on the side of the chassis, of the wooden chassis. So that is, these two speakers over here, they have a 50 microfarad capacitor between them and they are actually activated when this switch is activated. So it's an add-on because there's the speaker connection coming from the top and it allows the signal to pass through here into there through that one, through the capacitor, into there to ground. So you're basically s connecting in two more speakers to the system. I would like to try that. I'm going to find some speakers I can use there 
Um, I'd like to see how that sounds. So I will be finding uh, some replacements and putting them in when I finally uh, complete the, the chassis, the, the wooden, you know, the cabin restoration. I've noted here yellow loose wire. That's one of those loose wires that was hanging around there. And I like to make these notes so that I know where I'm going next. The same applies to this wire here, loose screen wire. There was a loose screen wire in here. What this does is it comes from the speaker through a 4K resistor, which is actually 3K and is correct. I measured 3K. There's 3K marked on there. The schematic says 4. Hey, if they made a mistake, it worked for years. So I'm leaving it as 3K. It comes through there if you activate it. If you activate this 4R switch and it then goes up here and to the base or the bottom of the volume control. So what this is doing is some form of feedback as well. And when you at the same time, you're bringing in these two external speakers. So this 4R sound is, is the result. Um, when I tested that, perhaps I can make a mention of it in, in a future video. Right, so all these were tested, all these contacts, connections were tested, and just so that you understand where I'm at, this is literally tested with a multimeter, point to point, all components are tested, the resistors are tested, some of them in circuit, some of them have to be disconnected on one end to test them, everything is tested one by one, with the exception of the orange ones, which, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't test those completely for leakage, so I painted them in in orange. And this is not the only part of the circuit that you will see painted in orange, and I'll explain why in a minute. The next was the, the, next was the second switch. Now, the second switching is actually for a preset tone control system. What it does is you have SPRA over here, which I believe is Parker or it's speech, and when you push that in, it activates a particularly um, uh, a preset tone, tone uh, selection which is conducive to improving the quality of speech coming through the radio. Um, it happens in most of these old radios have one form of, or another of this kind of preset. It, it bypasses the actual uh, tone control on board, you know, the, the volume, the, uh, not the volume, but the bass and the treble controls. They get bypassed. To show you that you've activated one of these, this particular, these particular lights, these two lights get switched off. And you can see that if, if this thing comes into here, it allows, it, it's switching in this, uh, the, these lamps to ground. So that goes through there, through there, through there, it stops. So these lights are off if it's like that. If you bring this down, it's shorter to ground, they're on. That's when it's not activated, actually. So when you activate it, it lifts the signal here, so these lights go off. These lights are the two lights on the sides of the front panel. They are the two lights that are literally lighting up the tones controls, the treble and the bass control. So it means that those two controls are no longer in effect. What you have is this preset tone control that's giving you speech. The second one, solo, this will give you a different frequency response um, to, the, to the signal. And furthermore, you can go one step further, you have the orchestra preset, which has the same effect. Uh, it activates these up here. This solo activates these up here. This down here is literally, these here literally just switch on or off those two light bulbs, those two little lamps over there. The actual tone control system is done through here because this switch up here is all one. That's the Sparker. The solo one is all this up here. And the orchestra is all this up here. So all these were tested. You actually have on the bottom here, you have a, a diagram of where these switches are. Um, you know, you've got your A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H over there and 1 to 12. And you can see what it is that's activating each one of them. There. That there says G, 4, 5, and 6. Those connector points are on top of those push button switches, those piano button switches. And you can find them quite easily going through that chart on the left-hand side that we've just seen there. 
So all those switches were checked, all those switches were functional. Then I had a choice. I could go back through this stage or my favorite, because FM is something that I particularly like to listen to, I decided to completely check the FM can, the FM receiver part of the circuit. And it was interesting. Um, I was receiving FM quite well in the lower frequencies. Further up the dial, I was getting very, very poor reception. So what, ha what I found was quite interesting. When I looked at the back of the radio, where the dipole antenna comes in, the FM antenna, this is what we find there. You have these two prongs, there are sockets at the back. There were two little capacitors going off, joining together to ground. Then there is a coil across those two with a center tap. And then this wire and this wire would go off or it goes off into that metal can with the FM circuitry inside. Now, I found, that I found two things straight away. The first thing is that both of these capacitors, both of these little caps, had the one end torn off. They were literally floating. Um, there was no ground connection. There wasn't even a wire there. It had broken off on both of them. Basically, the filtering was not working at all. And I replaced those two caps with little mica caps. Then, more importantly, I found that this wire over here, this one was here, over here, was completely loose and just desoldered from the can. Um, you wouldn't see it normally unless you pull the can up, which is what I did. It was underneath, it had desoldered, and it just wasn't making any kind of connection. The FM circuitry was only receiving a, mid, a very small part of the FM signal coming in from the antenna. It was not creating a field through this coil, uh, which would then go through to that coil and become the input to the FM circuitry that follows. So that was soldered on. And you'll see here that a lot of this is green and some of it is orange. This particular coil with a center tap that goes down here, this was measured for continuity. In other words, you put a, an ohmmeter on one end, you put a, the, the ohmmeter on the other end, you measure for continuity, you should get some very, very low resistances on these, ca on these uh, coils, and it was there. In other words, the continuity was there. They were connected. I did not measure the values. I have various ways of doing so, but it's really not worth it, and I'll explain why in a minute. Same applies to this one here, which is inside the actual can of the uh, FM receiver. And uh, when we go out of it, I'll show you that the whole, in the whole can that represents the FM radio section, this entire space over here, the only components and connections that were actually checked are the ones in green, right, for values, because they are resistors. So these resistor, resistors measured with the the usual accuracy that this radio has made us accustomed to, very, very precise in value. All these resistors were checked. These contacts were checked. Um, there's another resistor. There's another resistor. Some of these connections were checked as well. The other connections were checked generically. In other words, the components were checked to be there. They were checked to be making the contact properly. Their values were not checked. Um, and you might think, well, how the hell does this guy get away with doing a restoration and not checking some of these components? Hey, it's very simple. The radio is working. It is working to start off with. And this is a big, big, big plus when you're starting to restore a radio. Um, it's actually so important to me that it is worth, it's actually worth it for me to risk switching it on with the current limiters and so on just to try and get a signal out of it before I go in and invest a lot of time and money, um, you know, actually doing the restoration. Because if you don't have the radio working, you basically have to find the fault first. Now, if the radio is working, and I know or knew that FM was working perfectly, I know that the signal is coming out here pretty well. Now, some of the components that I changed, those input caps, 
the disconnected wire, that is just going to improve the reception, the performance of the radio. But it's not going to do much, um, much else. Um, and it's certainly not going to do you any good to sit here and measure the actual inductance value of these inductors, of these coils. You probably won't get the correct values without desoldering one end of them. They literally are as thin as a baby's hair. And you're probably going to do more damage to it um, by not being able to connect it properly later on than, than you would by leaving it and trying to improve the performance of the radio by replacing and checking what you can check. The reason I like to leave this in orange is that if I'm not happy with the result, I can always come back later on and go in depth again and uh, check some of these values. All the capacitors that I have not changed are of the type that generally do not create a problem. Uh, obviously, if they were the other type, I would open them up, check them anyway. Probably replace them just as a matter of course. This is the first uh, IF CAN. And again, you, you assume, and this is not that big an assumption, but you assume the insides are fine for now because it's working, right? If they go wrong, you've got quite a problem because you then have to tune everything up again. So again, I painted this orange. I check everything to the inputs of those cans and leave the rest for now. The same applies to the second can over here, right? And basically that is it. Yeah, all the circuitry has been checked. Everything is in order, in so much as one can affirm that. This part here at the bottom that you see that I haven't painted yet, this is just waiting to be painted in. I have it in the, in the worksheets. Um, what I do is I print out a small section of the schematic like this on paper and I go point to point and I mark it off and then I come back to the computer and, and put it in here to keep it as a more permanent record. So all this has been done and the same explanation applies so far. So what we have at the moment is a fully restored working radio on all, uh, on all bands. Um, and what I'd like to do next is I'm going to take a break from this particular project. Um, I will be working on the chassis, on the cabinet, I beg your pardon. The cabinet work is as interesting as watching paint dry sometimes because it literally involves a lot of drying paint. Um, so I might put some notes on the, uh, on video, onto video if I, if I find that I need to, uh, but otherwise we'll get back when we have the the cabinet uh, restoration complete and the radio back in its cabinet and back in in its full working order. My next project is actually quite interesting and uh, not that this one wasn't, for me they all are, but uh, the next one is one I have a particular love for. Uh, it's another Saba. Um, it's a Saba Freiburg W2 from 1952. Um, I have it on its way and I'm going to have some fun with that as well. So that'll be another uh, project to embark on very, very soon. Well, thanks for watching. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.